You may have seen the groundbreaking TED Talk that our special guest gave in 2006. But tonight, we are very honored that Majora Carter is here in person to inspire us in person. As a result of her determination as founder and director of the vanguard nonprofit Sustainable South Bronx, Majora's native Hunts Point section of the South Bronx is a greener, healthier, and more livable community than it was just a mere five years ago. Realizing, as she says, that there are South Bronxes all over the country, Majora founded an economic consulting company, Majora Carter Group. She now works in partnership with local governments, businesses, universities, and neighborhoods groups across the nation to transcend the limits of good nutrition educational efforts and to build economic imperatives that bring out the best in our communities and in ourselves. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Macar Majora Carter at the Museum of Science. Hello, Boston. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. So thank you very, very much for having me here. I am really pleased to be here. I got the chance to spend the whole day uh, in Boston talking to a bunch of different folks. So I'm really excited to end it here at the Museum of Science with you all. But um, I just want to just put it out there that basically you know, what I do is I tell stories. You know, they happen to be my story, but they're stories. And they're by nature designed to help people see that the, the, the path that I've taken in terms of the work that I do, you know, really has come from a, a particular place. And, but I do think that it's not, only, it's not necessarily at all, you know, confined to it. Because I believe that every, no one has to move out of their neighborhood to live in a better one. And that really is what this story is about. And so I thank you for that, and here we go. So my story actually does start right back um, with my mom and dad. You know, back in the 1940s, they were part of that great migration, you know, of folks, of black folks that moved up from down south in search of their great American life. Um, and they ended up settling in the Hunts Point section of the South Bronx, which was at the time um, mostly white, um, actually when my dad moved there, all white, um, working class community. And it was a walk to work neighborhood, which meant that folks walked from the residential section into the industrial section. Uh, and it, for, it, for manufacturing jobs. My neighborhood had so much of it, it was actually called Little Pittsburgh because we did so much steel work there. Other folks um, from down south and then later on the Caribbean followed suit, white flight. The highway construction boom also happened in our community. It happened all over the country as a matter of fact. Um, particularly sort of notorious when uh, the community in question was actually between two wealthy communities because it just meant that that neighborhood like the South Bronx was basically going to become the big parking lot in, in connecting uh, those two communities. Uh, redlining also happened. Um, that uh, was this is not the first financial crisis we had, you know, when banks did something that wasn't necessarily all that nice uh, to people. Um, redlining is a term that was, was, was came into, into, into fashion, I guess, in the 60s and 70s, where banks would literally draw red lines around uh, areas where they weren't going to make any kind of investment. And so what happens when that happens? Your property eventually is going to fall into disrepair, and, and it's just not going to be good if you can't make those kind of investments. Oh, and this is around the time that, that I came in. Um, I like to think of this actually as a very early networking opportunity. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm on the phone with, uh, you know, with Santa Claus, you know, telling him that the Easter Bunny says I've been a really, really good girl. Um, but that's, again, that's when I came in. But this is what I grew up with. I remember this financial disinvestment that was going on in, in our local community. Um, Landlords found it much more profitable to torch buildings, their own buildings, to collect insurance money than to try to wait for financing and investment and loans that just was not going to come in. So this is what I saw pretty much in the, before I was 10, you know, on a daily basis. Um, this was also a time of a lot of different types of uh, financial disinvestment. You know, literally um, our... Uh, you know, school systems pulling thing, out things like playgrounds because they didn't want the liability, you know, music and art programs being cut, all sorts of things of that nature, and teachers having to make do with very, very few precious resources. Um, but so these were the playgrounds of our youth. 
And, uh, and I do remember really clearly watching the nightly news with my parents and, and hearing that the South Bronx was on the news again for these, this like really horrible place where nothing but crime happened. And it was often referred to as a war zone. And I knew enough at the time, um, especially since I had a brother who actually had served two separate tours in Vietnam, to know that we actually were not in a war in this country. But that's the way that it felt sometime, especially when my big brother Lenny uh, was gunned down in the neighborhood over because of a drug war. So all of that type of, of, of economic disinvestment, you remember we used to have manufacturing in our community. There was a lot of vacancy after that. And um, what came in to take the, the place of that in, those, in that industrial area were many of the, these waste facilities and, and, and uh, power plants and all sorts of other noxious environmentally burdensome facilities that came in, which had a severe impact on us. Um, in particular, we have one of the country's highest childhood asthma hospitalization rates and also an extraordinarily high just asthma incident rate between children and adults as well. Diabetes and obesity also environmentally Related, um, if parents are feeling like they're, if they let their kid go outside to play in a place that they know is polluted, is it going to ex exacerbate their the, the asthma condition? Or if they feel that their kid's going to get hit by one of the many trucks that you know, roam through the neighborhood, um, you know, are they going to let them go outside and actually get the kind of physical activity that they need? Probably not. And the, one of the worst things that we discovered. Um, and that we kind of had some which we knew a little bit about was the fact that um, Columbia University did a study back in, I think, 2007 or 6, where they conclusively linked fossil, pro excuse me, proximity to fossil fuel emissions with learning disabilities in young children. And statistically, we know that poor kids who do poorly in school go to jail in this country, statistically. So it felt as though in communities like the South Bronx, where there was this, this, this disproportionate amount of fossil fuel emitting sources, that we were creating this kind of pathway directly from poverty into prison. And so when I moved back home, it was completely under duress. You know, the, the South Bronx of my youth still resonated in my head like this awful, awful boogeyman or demon that I really wanted to exercise but was clearly a part of me. And, and so I spent the bulk of my all of my formative years figuring out ways to get out. Education was the best one. I just figured I would never, ever go back to my community and except to visit my parents maybe, but that was it. But, you know, the universe had a different plan for me. Um, and one of them was that I did get into grad school, but I was too broke to live any place except for my parents' house. So... That's what I did for, for a number of years, and, uh, and I got to see my community in a completely different way, um, in particular through the, uh, when, when I moved back to my neighborhood under duress, I mean, I didn't want to be associated with it, but it was around the same time that our city and state were planning this huge waste facility right on our waterfront, and, and it occurred to me that, you know, having been around at that point because I'd been away to school, you know, I'd actually traveled a little bit, and I realized that, you know what? many places around the country aren't treated this way. And why is it that this really poor community of color, you know, and, and just a handful of them like it around the city are being disproportionately burdened this way? And I realized it was because it was, it was politically expedient to do so. And it was really just that simple. And I realized I could either pretend that I didn't see what I saw directly in front of me or I could actually work to do something about it. So I did work with, with my local community to help create a much more uh, sustainable solid waste management plan that the city eventually adopted. And re that was an amazing way for me to see you know, the power of actually being a part of something like that. But what, what was really interesting was that you know, throughout that process, one, one of the really interesting things through it was that it became clear to me that my local community, and me included, we knew how to fight against stuff but we had a little issue with figuring out what we wanted to fight for. And, and to that end, you know, da 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 da, here comes my dog, literally. Um, around the time we were fighting against the waste facility, I kept getting these notices about the, about the, the actually the US Forest Service was having, was open, was had this little tiny seed grant program where they were asking folks to, who worked in sort of, how they call them, strategic waterway areas, um, you know, places of, of, of 
really interesting significance, natural significance, and the Rosa Bronx River, which was the only true freshwater river in all of New York City. So that was a big deal to the Forest Service and, and folks like it. So I was like, okay, so they were saying, you know, work to restore this and we'll give you a little secret. And I was like, well, it'd be, I would do that, but I can't get to it because of all of the types of facilities on the map that I showed you earlier, they all lined our waterfront. So I was like, again, very thoughtful, well-meaning, but you clearly don't know your neighborhood the way that I know my neighborhood. And um, Again, da 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 da. There's my dog. Um, so I went jogging one day with her, and she when I when I got her, she was like this 20 pound crazy mutt, and when, then she grew into this 80 pound crazier mutt, and she pulled me into what I thought was just another illegal garbage dump in the neighborhood, and it was. I mean, but the it, it was for decades. It had been used as a construction and, and demolition dump, and there were weeds and piles of garbage literally over my head and if I didn't have an 80 pound dog in front of me there's no way I would have made it you know to the end of this dump which actually did end at the Bronx River and it was an extraordinary sight you know more than 50 feet across and in the, the way that the sunlight was glinting off the water you know that very early morning was just like look like these little gold birds flying out of the water and I just thought oh my god I can't believe this is my neighborhood I can't believe we've got something like this here. And so I literally turned around, picked my way through the trash with my dog, and started writing that proposal. Um, this is what that site looked like after about six cleanups, because I didn't think to document it the first time, the first many, many times I saw it um, and worked on it. Uh, but we were able to get you know, local people to help do cleanups. We worked to create partnerships with the local businesses, um, and even definitely our city and, and all sorts of anybody who I would would actually bother to listen to me, I talked to them about helping to transform this site. And we were, after a less than a year, we were able to turn it incrementally into this, which was a really wonderful kind of thing that we were very excited about. But several years later, we got a $3 million uh, allotment from the city to turn it into this. And it is actually an award-winning park. Um, we actually beat out Millennium Park in Chicago for a National Urban Planning Award, which makes me really, really excited. But um, um, it's really become the kind of beautiful place. Are you clapping because we beat Chicago? <laughs> which is fine by me. But um, I know it's not really the park, it's that. But anywho. Um, it really did reflect so beautifully on people. And, and, and you have to understand, for those of you that don't come from a place like the South Bronx, um, when folks think of a community that is more thought of in terms of its crime and its poor education and, and you know, people who just don't care, you know, to have something this beautiful and to know that it's yours and that it reflects well on you is an extraordinary thing for people to really take in. So we were really, it's become this incredible place for the community to just be in and be a part of and have it be uh, reflected on them in a what fabulous way. And it was so wonderful because I actually got a chance to get married there um, with Zena, my dog is my flower girl. Yeah, she, she's still kicking, she's 13 years old now. <laughs> yeah, it's my puppy. But, um, <laughs> So, but it wasn't just a great place for me to get married and to show off you know, my, my dog training skills, which are quite minimal. But um, <laughs> the, um, it also helped us think about what else could, did we want in our local community. And one of those things came in the form of a federal transportation program called CMAC, which stands for Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality. And someone who worked for the Regional Transportation Committee told me about this, this grant proposal. And it was specifically designed um, to do uh, non-vehicular transportation projects. And I thought, you know, okay, I don't really know what that means, but a little bit of research discovered things called greenways, you know, dedicated bike and pedestrian pathways. And I also did a little bit more research and realized that there was this greenway that went all the way up from, or from Maine to Miami, but it completely bypassed the South Bronx. And I thought, we should be connected. And so I wrote this proposal to, so that we could be connected to the rest of the East Coast Greenway. <laughs> um, and we won a $1.25 million planning grant to design a feasibility study you know, for that. And, it, and a Greenway you know, has economic development opportunities. You know, it can really serve to support you know, the development of, of businesses that are along it. Um, stormwater management uh, possibilities as well as, you know, since it's green, air quality improvement, and of course, physical recreation opportunities as well. Um, it also created a great opportunity, you know, for just because when we had that plan, we were raised about $50 million. Um, some of it through the um, economic stimulus plan because it was a shovel-ready project, and, it, and I think I believe that it's still the only community-initiated uh, 
non-vehicular transportation project that was funded through the stimulus package. So I think that's a pretty big deal. And this is construction, which I just love, love seeing. So it's literally being built as we talk, our own little stimulus package, you know, which, which I help bring to life in our community. Um, we also worked really hard on developing um, Having, you know, especially if you're from a neighborhood where people don't even feel as though there is an environment um, or that you have to go outside of it to experience it. We really had to work to make sure that folks in our community felt both a personal as well as a financial stake in it. Um, they saw the personal because they wanted to, their, their kids and the people and the children in their neighborhood to not be plagued with the kind of public health issues that they'd been plagued with before. But job creation was also a huge driver. So I started one of the country's very first green collar job training and placement systems that trained people in the skills of ecological restoration, um, starting with uh, wetland restoration on the Bronx River, no, no surprise there. Um, um, but then moving into urban forestry management and then later on green roofing and even learning how to clean up contaminated land you know, for, for active reuse. And um, the really amazing thing about this program was, yes, folks learned the hard skills, but we also taught the soft skills. And the people in our program were, there were folks that had some pretty serious barriers to employment people who were generationally impoverished, people who were um, incarcerated for a while, and some veterans as well. And these were the, the same people you know, who many of them had not even seen a family member or had had a, a legitimate job themselves. So we had to teach them things like, you know, how do you be a team player? You know, how do you be a leader in your own life? And even something as simple as making sure you look busy when your boss is around. <laughs> if, they, if you don't know, you don't know. So, but clearly you all know that, so it's, it's probably a good thing. But, and that's why we were able to get the, the kind of employment um, rate that we did, the placement rate that we did, because we really worked really hard to make sure that we trained people and also worked to make sure that there were jobs for them at the end of the day. One of the ways we did this was actually creating um, uh, businesses ourselves and then working on policy that would, would support these this, the new types of this type of businesses. Green roofs, um, in particular, it's, an, it's a sustainable building technique that's been done um, in the um, uh, in Europe for more than 50 years at this point where they literally plant a roof for its stormwater management benefits because um, it, it attracts between 75 to 90 percent of the storm water that falls on it so it doesn't have to be funneled through in a very expensive sewage treatment and water treatment process um, it's a green layer so it actually helps clean the air um, it also provides um, you know when you have plenty of them you know in mass it literally lowers the ambient temperature of that of the surrounding air which means you lower your energy costs as well and I'm showing lots of people work because these are jobs, none of which can be outsourced. So these are all, and those, all those municipal benefits, you know, are, occur and, and, and support the local economy right there. So this is the roof that we did on top of my, we, my the company's first customer was me. Um, and we did a roof on top of my building. And this is it, just a, like the cheapest one we could buy, basically. But it turns out that this is what it looks like, you know, when it's not under, you know, four inches of snow like it is right now. Um, and we showed that there were different types of green roofs that you could do as well, which allowed us to uh, to show that the, the different kind of varied things you can do. We did a little, very small little um, uh, medicinal herb garden and some urban agriculture there as well. Um, best strawberries in the world, and of course, it, it also opened up this place, you know, to even to be. Um, inviting to wildlife. You know, this was a hawk that kind of took up residence you know, on our roof as well. And so we're not saying that we're never going to see um, that this, those type of green infrastructure projects um, will negate the, the need for things like municipal stormwater management systems like, like these. But what they do do is provide a municipal service in a really wonderful way. So this is the roof that, um, that it literally is a Google map of, of my, my building. But this is the, what we'd like to see if we really start thinking about and start implementing jobs in green infrastructure. You know, the fact that they do provide municipal services and they also provide um, re helping to reduce social services as well because we know that for the folks that are out there, you know, who actually need jobs, many of them, um, people who 
you know, are generationally impoverished, you know, people that are coming back from our oil wars, uh, people who are, you know, ex-convicts as well. When you get them the kind of skills that they need to do this kind of work, those are, there are also therapeutic benefits associated with that as well. Huge bodies of research on that too. So you've got the therapeutic benefits of, you know, helping to reintegrate people well and socially into society. You've got the municipal benefits because they actually help lower all those costs. You also have the, um, the social service benefits because they provide Provide, they provide real legitimate ways to, to, to engage people to get them income while making them so that they're not tax burdens, but they become taxpayers. So there's a, a huge amount of reasons why this should actually become something of the norm rather than, um, than like a, just a little simple demonstration project. And we're working on that. We're actually working on that with um, with the group now, so wish us luck. And hopefully, it'll actually become more of the norm rather than, than not. Um, so I got people, um, look, there's like really no secret when you, when you think about like, like stereotypically like a poor neighborhood, you know, there definitely are people that are involved in the drug trade. Many of them there, um, maybe because it's romanticized, but many of them, um, if you get a chance to talk to them the way I actually have, um, it's because it is a job. I got people really interested in the South Bronx in this type of work, not because, you know, I talked to them about the environment. I didn't really, you know, I talked to them about their health and then I saw them see the benefit, you know, to them and especially in terms of jobs as well. And, and I think the same thing um, is going to have to happen when we're thinking about what do we need to do around the development of, um, excuse me, the development of our urban, frankly, disrupting you know, America's agricultural system in support so that we can actually create the kind of healthy food systems that we seriously need. You know, what are we going to have to do to start talking to people into thinking, what can we do? And so I think community gardens and, and, and most different types of, of urban agriculture are just amazingly beautiful options in terms of community building and open space development. But until we can kind of crack the nut on the, the, our ability to use that as a vehicle to create jobs, I think that it's, it's not really going to move to where we really want it to go. And look, I love Michelle Obama for putting, up, for putting it out there that food is, is going to be their next revolution. I mean, when she got out there with that cute little cardigan and her little shovel, I mean, I think she changed the way America thought about food. And I love her for that. But now I think, you know, it is on us to really push, put the, um, you know, the pedal to the metal and really take this to another level, especially in terms of job creation. And, um, and so when I think about this, you know, it is about how do we develop capacity, you know, to create, make our hometowns more secure. And I think urban agriculture is a way to seriously do that. That is, by definition, hometown security, figuring out ways to make that happen. And um, so... What we're actually working on is developing a national brand of urban grown produce. And we're doing it, you know, specifically to sort of disrupt, you know, the American food system to really think about how do you use some of the established or bet the best cases for um, uh, food distribution that are currently existing, you know, in, in our cities right now with bringing it when the best kind of technology that we have, hydroponics in particular, so that you can grow food enough to scale to actually do, to really be a real market, you know, for the, for the retail as well as for the, um, the uh, institutional establishments that are out there and, um, and really take advantage of better transportation systems. But again, for us, the operative word is national brand. It's the branding that I think we're really going to have to work on. Um, and the brand that we worked on, we, work, we worked on it with the same uh, company that did the Red Campaign, the Project Red Campaign that, that raised a huge amount of uh, food for, um, uh, excuse me, not a food amount of food, but a lot of money for research and for AIDS in Africa. Um, and what we're trying to do is create the same type of, of benefit for around a local brand of food. So as you know that it's grown in your local community. You know that it is, um, you know, essentially that it creates the type of jobs in your neighborhood. So you really want it to be, because I'm not really trying to think about um, growing food to feed people, because I think ultimately what we want to do is we want to grow this industry so that we can actually employ people and developing those type of models and making sure that the business models are out there in order to do that is the most important thing that we can do. And we've noticed that to some extent, you know, when you could get, get people to be behind um, a marketing campaign 
folks will do something to support it if they know that they're rooting for their own community. And people do have this, whether it's a problematic relationship with their hometown or not, for the most part, people want it to succeed. And so if, if the branding allows for an additional avenue you know, for people that want to support their hometowns to do so, as it also supports different, um, different vehicles for neighborhood revitalization, because these particular pieces of infrastructure will be in those communities, then you actually have something going. Because you, it, it is about growing jobs as much as it is about growing food. And until we figure out a way to crack that, that type of nut, I, I, I think that we're not going to be able to really just be dis as disruptive as, as we need to be in terms of creating new models for economic empowerment in our community around food. And so that's what we're really working on as well. And uh, so the other thing that I really want to share with you all, you know, is one of the things I'm working on right now. And in term, and really, when we thought about um, urban agriculture and looking around and seeing what you need to be doing in poor communities in order to really create the kind of, of stability and economic development in them. Um, you know, first of all, it, it came clear to me that there were some very serious issues with what goes on in terms of, of, excuse me, real estate development in general in poor communities. And that's the fact that there really are only two kinds of development in poor communities. Um, one is the, the first kind sort of promotes only gentrification and displacement and assumes that that's going to happen. You know, the poor folks that are there that actually stay through the tough times are eventually just going to be moved out. Or there's going to be um, one that just assumes a certain amount of poverty level economics are just going to be the norm there. That is the status quo. So you'll see the same type of strip clubs or or waste facilities or um, check cashing stores or, or 99 cent stores, the kind of like very low value um, economic development that and, and that value value goes right out of the community because chances are they're generally not owned by anybody who lives in those communities. So it's, is it really local economic development? No, not at all. So with that, um, you know, so my experiences and just being around, you know, do being on, on the road as much as I've been and actually doing speaking and listening and advisory, you know, towards over the past three years, it really did make me come close face to face with the fact that it is now time to seriously use real estate development as a driver for the kind of economic economic change, not just housing change that we need to see in our community, and also, and also to help us deal with the unintended consequences of integration. And there's some folks who are just like you know sort of like well, integration is a good thing, and yeah, it is. You know, it's a wonderful thing, and we're happy about that. But one thing that I think we we kind of what we don't necessarily take into account is some of the the unintended things that, that happened. You know, when we, when segregation was quite legal, we had very, we might have had racially segregated communities, but we had economically diverse ones. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't uncommon, you know, to see someone who was practicing medicine or dentistry who lived next door to a teacher, who lived next door to a janitor, and, you know, and then there might have been someone who actually didn't have a job, some wino or something living amongst them. But, you know, but there was a certain understanding that, you know, there were different types of folks, different type of economic uh, uh, a strata within the same type of community so that people understood that there were different ways of being, you know, in, in our communities. And I think that what it was, it was very much, I think, a multi-class neighborhood and it was aspirational in, the, in those ways. And I think when we created um, or when segregation became illegal, what we also segregated was hope. Because those that actually had the means to move out of those communities because they had the ability to go generally left to places that were nicer for them to be in. And those that didn't have it were left behind. And I even saw that to some extent when, um, when, the, when, when my neighborhood was burning and you know, you'd go leave at the end of, you know, for summer vacation and then come back you know, for the school year, and the, the folks that had the parents you know, who actually had real jobs, the ones that dressed better than the rest of us, um, those were the ones who didn't come back because their families were moved you know, upstate or you know, into another borough in New York City or wherever, but they were just not there anymore. And um, you know, the hopeful ones left. I mean, my parents bought their house in 1947. It really wasn't worth the paper that it was written on you know, by the time I was, I was born. So where were we going to go? We stayed and watched it burn. Um, you know, I heard today, actually, uh, 
just the horrible story of someone, because no matter where, where I do a talk, for the most part, I always find somebody, somebody who's from the Bronx, who was originally from the Bronx. And I met this woman who said that she was from the Bronx. And so I asked her, I was like, well, where are you from? And she's like, I don't exactly remember. My family moved later back down south. And, um, but, one of my, but my aunts decided to stay up. And then we lost track of her. And then we went, literally drove up to find her because we just didn't hear from her for a year. We came back up and all that was left was a shell of the building that she lived in. And I just think about the, 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 what happened, you know, that, those are like war zone stories that happened right here. And it just, and it hit me that what we were experiencing was the kind of thing that we actually could do something about right now. And we can use real estate development as a way to help change that. And so that being said, I uh, think that real estate development can be used as a platform for engagement for a lot of things. This particular site is a, it's a former juvenile detention center around the corner from the house that I grew up in, actually, in the house of, I live across the street from right now. And um, I thought about I've been thinking about this place for a long time. I mean, every day I saw it on my way to school or work or whatever. Huge, a four-acre building, big white building, you know, multi-story. You can't, you can see it from like every part of the neighborhood practically. And um, it was just recently closed because it was a place that prison reform advocates and also children reform advocates had been trying to close down pretty much since the day it was open because it was always horribly run just so badly managed, corrupt, corrupt place. I mean, there was there were um, um, incidences of, of of people actually of administrators literally using kids to do some very nefarious things. I mean, it's been going on for a long time. Finally, got closed, and I remember just the, not very long ago when I literally walked up the hill, looked down at this site, and I was like, "This is our platform for engagement. If we can transform this boogeyman of a of a place." into something that our community would want to see happening, then we can really change the trajectory of how we do real estate in this country. And I decided then and there that I wanted to transform this into a mixed income housing and mixed use real estate development, mixed, mixed use in terms of economic development, so manufacturing, retail, commercial development going into it as well. And I thought about it and was just so excited by the opportunity that, that, that it presented itself. And there were many reasons why I was incredibly excited. Um, you know, one was that we have some things cooking in our community already. The Greenway, that green line, you know, right there is a really important piece right there that goes around it. But the site is right here. And if you take a look on that, that gray line is the highway that separates, you know, the peninsula part of the community from the other side. But these red lines indicate um, commercial districts. Now, they might not be the most thriving commercial districts at all, but, you know, they are commercial districts. All those little yellow dots indicate population density. You see there's a bunch more on this side, only one on this side, but the population density is exactly the same. And there are room, there's room definitely to do a lot more work over here as well. Oh. And also, we're right on the other side. On these sides are our um, some pretty cool mass transit. You know, we go on both sides of Manhattan. You can get pretty much anywhere you want in the city pretty easily from this area. And this, I think, sort of indicates what we find in a lot of, of, of um, of cities around the country that actually had manufacturing in it, you know, back in, in their heyday. You know, that there was a residential section on one side that sort of abutted the industrial section. Of, you know, it used to be Little Pittsburgh, now it's a lot of chop stop, chop chop shops, um, you know, waste facilities and things of that nature, um, which are which we, we can talk about a little bit later, but the site rests right in the middle of it. It's almost right on, on the hinge of that thing. And again, connecting it to greenway development and mass transit and other types of development is, is really important you know, going forward. And so we're thinking of this as a way, at the site, as a catalyst for the types of development that we know could happen in many different ways. <coughs> so. Housing, you know, when I think of it, you know, affordable housing, yes, we have to have some in supportive housing as well, but it is the mixed income housing that I think is a really important um, piece where you can actually build up the kind of, 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 of housing that is attractive enough to people who want to live there who actually come from higher income levels. And that 
falls right in with a whole bunch of other things that go next. The manufacturing education piece. This Right now, we are one of the poorest congressional districts in the country. We want to create opportunities for people to become less poor. So building in models for commercial development, in particular manufacturing, bringing it into the 21st century is something that we are absolutely dedicated to do. Public space, it is the great democratizer. It is the one thing that you can do in this, in this world that requires absolutely no money and everybody can enjoy it as, just as well as anybody with lots of money. Um, so you have the green markets, then the, the community markets and gardens and plays of that nature. And commercial and retail development, when we did a very informal poll, and actually when I just did the math on my own life, and I realized even though I live in this community and very dedicated to it, I spend almost no money in my own neighborhood. Why? Because there's nothing that I would spend it on. Seriously. Like, the food is a horror. Um, there's, you can't get your shoes repaired. You can't find a bookstore. There are no cafes. There are no restaurants. There aren't any places that, that, you know, that people would actually do have a little bit of, of extra income would do. And then I started talking to people, you know, that, you know, you would think, okay, what are they doing? And they're shopping at Trader Joe's. They're going to Whole Foods. This is what folks are doing because it's, because we don't have that kind of opportunities in our own community. And I realized we are missing an opportunity by not having these type of things in our own communities. And yes, we still have to do a lot more work in terms of a lot of market research and do some more analysis, but we really do believe that, our, that we know that there's plenty of money in poor communities that they're, that they're spending outside of our communities. So we wanna make sure that we're bringing some of it and keeping it back home and employing people in the process. And um, so we wanna phase this kind of thing in. You know, it's because right now it is this, the Spofford Juvenile Detention Center or the youth house as we used to call it, the place where bad kids used to go and the place that my father was actually a janitor in you know, back in the 1970s, um, and who would talk about, you know, that he wanted to, our house to be bigger so he could bring some of these kids there so they could actually have a better life because they knew they were just going to be broken when they came in here. This place literally is still considered a boogeyman in, in, in the eyes and in the hearts of my community, and actually, I think, nationally in terms of, and definitely around the city. And so we really need to immediately start thinking about how do we change the perception of this place right now. And so one of the things we want to do, and we're working, um, you know, with our city, City and with our borough president and uh, and also the New York City Green Market, which handles all of the the um, the farmers markets in the city, um, taking one of these uh, one of the empty parking lots that are there and transforming it into a wholesale to the public farmers market. And also, you know, use one of the the the, the big kitchens that are inside, um, which we think we will still be will get access to to serve as a community as a um, as a commercial kitchen, you know, for many of the, the the small business owners that work in food around the area and all around the Bronx. We're also really interested in also bringing in more that that 21st century manufacturing I told you about, really inspired by um, actually this project, which was a direct. Um, uh, descendant of the MIT Media Lab um, at, at uh, yeah at MIT, so we're really excited about Fab Labs, and it's short for Fabrication Laboratories, where you connect a personal computer with uh, fabrication machines, and once you know how to operate the software, you can pretty much make anything that you want. And the idea is that it really allows people to become creators and inventors in their own in their own right. And this, in particular, all everything that you see in here, it was actually created on one of the Fab Labs. And um, and again, we brought this 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 mobile unit to the South Bronx, um, you know, with the support of MIT in order to show folks that they too could be creative and create stuff. And people really were true to the, what we knew was going to happen. Um, we also, as you know, we, we get a lot of waste materials coming into our community or stuff that's considered waste, but some really enterprising young people in, in our community realized that the pallet boxes that a bunch of, of the, um, the, the, the stuff that in our neighborhood comes in on actually just gets thrown away. But when you took them apart, they realized that they were really nice hardwood and that they could be turned into, um, and it could literally be turned into the kind of uh, this stuff. So this was actually a really nice little um, side business for a bunch of young men from our community where they made this kind of custom made furniture you know, for a couple folks, which was really kind of nice. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, 
And so, Faye, again, building on what we are already working on, the South Bronx Greenway in particular, it is already happening. So building on that and really using that as a jumping off point, in particular for thinking about places that, you know, no one really thinks about right now. Like that, I hope you can't, you probably can't really see the top picture, but that's one of the, the backside of the building that really nothing goes on right now. I mean, there's some very, like, low-end type of operations that happen there. There's a couple of, actually, at least two illegal chop shops, um, you know, um, auto repair places. Um, but basically, it's more known as a place for truckers to come in and be serviced by prostitutes because nothing goes on there. But when you open that up and you activate that ground plane, you know, those good uses will drive out the bad ones. And, you know, maybe somebody will be unhappy about it, but most of us will be very happy about it, frankly. So... But the thing that is most encouraging to me and is really exciting about this is that, or, and actually the thing that when, when I think about it that would be so horrible is if, um, if we built this project and the project was only beautiful on that one little four acre site. We are really interested in, in really having this particular project raise the bar for what is economic development throughout the entire community. We want folks to recognize that, you know, when you do add a little support to the local businesses, that when you do, you know, this is going to sound really gross, but there is there are some some businesses who I think would do fine, but right now they don't think that anybody cares. So one of one you have one bit bodega that actually smells like cat pee. And I don't think he's a bad person, but I don't think he thinks that anybody cares. But when you have something like this, actually sort of serving as you know, the kind of thing, and it raises expectations for what everybody will expect, that's what you get. And I really fully anticipate that that's what it's going to do in terms of really revitalizing the idea of what it's like to do business and be in business and to live in a community like this. And so we're excited that we know that what's going to happen on this site isn't just going to remain only on this site. It is going to raise the bar for what is acceptable and what is possible and what is beautiful and what is needed and necessary in our communities. And I know that it's, it's not that this particular approach is going to be one that's going to be lasting of well outside of you know the, my, my hometown of the South Bronx. This is the kind of thing I want to see happening all over the country, and I'm really excited about that. And I think about that in particular because I know that, you know, when I think about this particular quote, you know, and the fact that, you know, Dr. King might have been talking about it just integration, you know, at this point, that we need to be impatient about our need to, to really think about a world that is better than the one that we're in right now. Um, when I think about real estate development and using it as a platform to really create the kind of world that we want to live in, that's what I think about. I am incredibly impatient for this stuff to start happening right now. And, and I'm willing to do all the work that I need to do to make sure that it happens. And we're really excited about going forward there. And you know, I definitely know that there are things that you are also incredibly excited about doing on your own, and I'm happy to come back and help you. But the bottom line is, is that I know that ultimately you've got to want it for yourselves. And I know that you do. And again, if I could be of any help, I'm happy to make that happen. But in the meantime, let's just all be as impatient as possible so that we can do the kind of great world that we know is possible. Thank you. Thanks. So thank you. So I think we've got Time for questions, actually plenty. And there's a couple folks with microphones outside or somewhere. Where are the microphones? Hi, okay, there you go. So if there are any questions, just raise your hand. Um, thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. I am um, really interested in the um, route for whatever city, <laughs> the program. Exactly. And, um, Your city so, here. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm actually new to the city. But um, I, so I, um, how, so do you connect um, urban farmers with that campaign? I'm just curious kind of the logistics of how all of that works. Oh, we're not there yet. You're we're working, there yet. we're You're developing just... it right now. Okay. And it's not necessarily, you know, for urban farmers. It's for, it's, it's literally a job creation vehicle. So there will be plenty of jobs for folks that are, you know, for master farmers and, and all those folks as well. But ultimately, it's, it really is an economic development generator. And people who may, they may or may not have an interest 
in agriculture, quite frankly. Um, it would be great if they were because there will be definitely be jobs in there, but there's also going to be um, you know, jobs in this. The model that we're looking at um, actually for a one acre site uh, it has about 25 people you know, that you can employ uh, for, each for each acre that you have. However, probably only about six of them are literally the farmers. I mean, there's, just a, there's a whole bunch of other things from facilities to R&D to um, what are some of the other things? Oh, marketing and sales, you know, and distribution. You know, they may or may or not even touch it. But, but frankly, I think that's where agriculture is going. And urban agriculture in particular has to. Because if we can't get it, you know, from, a, from an urban farm to somebody who wants to buy it, we might as well not even grow it. So it, 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 is much, it is as much about the, the overall uh, field of urban agriculture. And, um, you know, and I and certainly really hope that there will be farmers because who, out there who really want to, to make the move to this kind of technology. And I really do because they're obviously um, incredible, you know, wellsprings of information. But, um, but I think that there's going to be the, the folks that are doing traditional community garden or, you know, in the ground and, and dirt kind of farming. But this, this isn't it actually. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm wondering if this, the, um, the urban farming thing, the hydroponics, um, has to do with this place, Sky Vegetables, that's here in Natick. And Wait, say that again? I missed There's the... a local place in Natick, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, called Sky Vegetables, that's doing hydroponics uh -huh. and trying to bring rooftop gardening hydroponics to cities. Um, and I understood they had some project in the Bronx. I wondered if you were involved with it, or if not, if you could talk about the one that you do know and the economics of how it works, because it takes so much capital to get yeah. these things built. It does, and and there the, the the we've done a lot of research and we've looked at more places than you know I can remember at this point, and. You know, there's some that are much more capital intensive than others, and there's ways you can lower your, your capital input, frankly. You know, there's a lot of ways to do it, and that's, that's the, fun, the really fun thing that we're discovering. Um, there's a bunch of different um, uh, projects that are going on. I don't think there's any that are operational in the Bronx just yet. There is one that's, that's coming. I think that's the one that's getting a lot of press, right? a Bluestone, I think it's called. Um, but there's, there's plenty more in Brooklyn uh, and in Queens. That's where the, the, but they are, but, but they're not. Um, only one's hydroponic, one in Long Island City, and that's Gotham Greens. And they're actually doing pretty good, as far as I know. I mean, you could go to Whole Foods in New York City and actually buy their products, which makes me very, very happy. So there's plenty of room out there for it. Yeah. Hey, Majora. My name is Hi. Dawn Tesserero, and I got to see you on a live feed through uh, Trinity Wall Street. I don't know if huh. it was a year ago. Wow, oh, that was a long ago. time ago. I can't yeah. remember. It, it all huh. blurs, you know? Um, so I want to first say that was a spiritual community at BU that was plugged in and we were amazed and thrilled and it was awesome. Um, I'd like to know for your Root Boston and or urban gardening, are you thinking about or is it similar to the model of a CSA but in an urban environment? Nothing like it. Nothing like it No, well? this is really, this is and it's really. It's only hydroponics and it's not dirt? Yes, it's, it'll be hydroponics. Mm -hmm. um, there will be so it's it's, a, it's do folks know what a community supported agriculture is really, of course there's like a bunch of food people Maybe. Um, yeah <laughs> so it's really not like that I mean basically we're looking to create um, uh, relationships with institutions and also with retail establishment because frankly getting the middleman out of that is the way to actually make the like the most money in terms of the the way that we've actually looked at the market analysis for this so it's not really a CSA although there will be plenty of opportunities you know and we'll have to look at them on a case by case basis or rather city by city basis in terms of what what other types of markets are are there for value added products because there will be processing on site for us for some things and so we're literally looking at different things if, if something is even though bees won't be obviously within a greenhouse there definitely are some markets where honey is a really big you know not so much honey but doing value added honey based products is a very big deal and so thinking about ways like how do you incorporate those into that model so it's under the root for a brand so that people know that their purchase is literally supporting their local economy so it's all about it it is seriously, it is about how do you know where you got this from because you, because you see it on the label and because you know that good gosh darn well that you can actually go to the place and see where it's done. 
I'm curious if you can um, talk about, is there a model of development for commercial urban agriculture that's um, coming to be? Um, I volunteer with a group in, um, in Boston along Blue Hill Ave for folks that live here. Um, and they're attempting to start a commercial ag program. They have two different plots that they're working on. And I just go and farm with them so I can learn from the farmers. Um, but it sounds like it is a really high initial input. It is. A lot of people rely on grants. Yep. And I'm curious. And volunteers. Grants and volunteers to mm -hmm. get going. Um, and most likely, they're not planning on paying that back. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if, if there is sort of a model of what the development of these commercial urban agriculture centers look like so that yeah. they go from that to being a profitable place that employs local people. Right, and then for some folks, you know, the volunteer approach is actually fine because they're literally working on developing, using it more as an education model, you know, or developing open space, and that has value. And I do not want to dismiss that by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, I think it's, you have to have that kind of stuff. But from the research that we've done, and we've been doing it a lot at this point, and because we don't want to like, you know, BS anybody about this thing. You know, it's it is nearly impossible to compete. You know, with 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 fruits and vegetables that are grown south of our borders. I mean, it's just the way that the trade works, the way that our American food system works. It is not set up to support local. So there will have to be, you know, some forms of, of subsidies, however you want to call them. The way in our model, we have to have free land. We have to, you, in order to do this, you can't do it otherwise. So you develop those relationships with you know, the municipality, and that's how we're doing it right now, it's because ultimately, if we're doing it as a job creation vehicle, and using it that way so that there are, whether it's wage subsidies or anything like that, to support people that normally would be on social services, we're looking at that as a value add to a city's bottom line. and. We're getting traction on it because we're being incredibly explicit about like this is not just you giving us free land because you think we're cute. No, we're giving we're asking for free land because we ultimately want to take people off the unemployment rolls and out of the social service budget. And and there is going to have to be some soft capital in there, you know, whether it's philanthropic or rather incredibly slow money. Um, and that's fine. But I think ultimately, you know, we're starting everybody who's working in this field is starting from such a disadvantage because, you know, the, all those those things that were put into place so that we could feed America after the Great Depression, you know, have really come back, you know, in the and and you know, even what it, even just the way that fertilizers were done. Those things were not weren't, weren't done to make our lives miserable. They were done to make our lives better. But unfortunately, you know, it's kind of haunting us right now. But now I think we have to recognize that we are so new. Be a little gentle with ourselves and do everything that we need to do. So be happy supporting the folks that are work that are doing it with volunteers and be grateful that somebody's forking over some money philanthropically to help make it happen. But ultimately, we, we've got to get to the point where we can really monetize the value of this um, from a social service perspective. And I think that's that's the kind of approach that we're taking, frankly. Who's got the mic? Hi. Oh, hi. Um, thank you so much for coming. Oh. It's such a pleasure to listen to you in person. I'm a high school teacher. I've brought a couple of students with me tonight. Hello. And, uh -huh. and I, I do use your TED Talk <laughs> every year in class. And for a few reasons. I mean, it's incredibly informative. But I also think it's really inspirational. And I think that's one of the things that I try to instill in my kids is that you might just be one person, but you can make a difference. And one of my favorite parts of the TED Talk is when you kind of call Al Gore out <laughs> about the fact that we really need grassroots groups at the table, at, at the bargaining table, making policy. And I was just wondering, you know, it's been a while since you did the TED Talk. Do you <laughs> see a difference in how that's going? Um, is there any part of what you're working on now that's really working sort of that more political angle where you're trying to get people to lobby for you. So yeah. just wondering about the change in that aspect of your work. Yeah, a lot's been, I mean, I did that talk, oh my goodness, six years ago. Goodness gracious. No, five years ago, I can't count. Um, and so yeah, a lot has gone on. And, and what I've discovered since then is that, you know, I've been working on project-based development and really, and did use policy, you know, as a, and really worked, to, did the projects first and to push the policy forward, but now I realize that 
it's we have to have an even more deliberate approach to it and start thinking about like I am thinking about you know who are the folks that I need to be talking to in order to make this policy law and not you know not because we never did it as an add-on it was always there as a really strategic piece but I think we now we have to be even more deliberate because I mean the case in point food in particular if we can't really rationalize monetarily and from, from regulations and, and a social service standpoint, why it's important to have a local food system, we will never ever have one, and or not a real one anyway. We'll have we'll be playing local food, which is what we're kind of doing right now. But let's like get real about it, and how do we really make that happen? And that's what structurally we're going to have to do. So whether it's with the type of real estate development that we're talking about, so that it's you know I love I think affordable housing is a wonderful wonderful thing, but we need different levels of affordable housing so that we can actually have economic diversity in communities. I'm really, really just bothered a lot by the fact that, you know, when we talk mostly affordable housing, we mean poor in, in poor communities, which we, which we know at this point doesn't really have the kind of aspirational components that actually produce the kind of economic diversity that we need. It doesn't really, they don't really work. And um, so if we're going to push policies, then let's push them in ways that really create the kind of stability and security that we want to see happening. So that's where that's where we are and really being deliberate about that. Hi. Over here. Sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, your TED Talk actually also was very inspirational to me and uh, now attending graduate school. So I'm a dual degree in urban environmental planning and nutrition policy. Cool. Um, and I'm also currently working on a project with the Conservation Law Foundation in Boston, um, trying to quantify jobs for urban agriculture, which is exactly what you're talking mm -hmm. about. And you're exactly- Wait, What's the name, Conservation Law? Conservation Law Foundation. Um, and you're absolutely right that that's the nut that needs to be cracked. Um, and we've actually quantified jobs at a much lower number. And even with the number that we have, uh, we're having a very hard time having that stick with mm -hmm. people that we're talking to and kind of as we're testing it along the way. And I have two questions. One is, well, I guess to step back, we've also made the same assumption that really, if you're going to make jobs within an, with using urban agriculture, you need to take that whole food system supply chain and have that happen on that plot or mm -hmm. with that organization. It's the only way it'll right. happen. Um, I'm curious, those 25 jobs, are you thinking those as full-time employees? Yeah. Uh, okay. The uh, person who, there's um, a group that's been working out in Jersey um, called, um, it's, their, their acronym is GUSIF, which is really unattractive, but it's a, a Garden State Urban Farms. And the woman who we've been working with was actually working, you know, um, um, you know, in the financial service sector for a really long time. And she's running it as a for-profit now. And that's what she's doing, and she's actually doing it without any wage subsidies. But we're thinking that it might make sense to do it, you know, in particular from a workforce development angle, like how much more would we be able to do, you know, if you could actually make this thing happen. And, you know, and, and it is capital, you know, intensive, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But in terms of the, the type of profit that she's generating right now, like that's, you know, I think we, could, we can totally do that. Okay. Yeah. And I'm also wondering... Uh, are you facing any opposition with this assumption or with this model of 25 jobs per acre, and how do you deal with that opposition? We haven't had any to this point. That's great. Yeah. No, I mean, to, uh, for a local community to get 25 jobs and is for anything is a real is a pretty that's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, for a new job coming in, for a new business coming in, I mean, we get the kind of things you know when, for example, um, FedEx opened up, you know, a huge, um, uh, what do you, basically it's a parking lot, um, you know, in our, in our neighborhood, um, huge, brought in like an extra thousand trucks a week. We got 12 jobs over three years. <laughs> People be really happy to know that they can compete for 25. So yeah, it's a really, it's an interesting dynamic. Believe me, it's, you, you, there's, you really, I mean, this is the thing about job creation, especially in places where you see so little of it, you would be surprised, you know, how excited people would be, you know, to just to know that there's, that there's something out there. That is the glimmer of hope that most people don't have at this point. And believe me, 25 jobs that this, that this, that this woman's actually doing, um, they're not volunteers. They're not. So that makes me really happy. Oh, big question where? Oh, hi. Goodness hi. gracious, all the way over there. I didn't even know anybody was there. I'm sorry. Well, that's fine. 
Um, since I work with communication, I'm interested in asking you a question about branding. I was really impressed with the Root brand, and since you're dealing with a lot of situations where buildings have been in bad shape, for example, the juvenile detention center mm -hmm. and the brownfields you deal with, how do you um, how do you handle rebranding those in a place that people actually want to visit them? Oh, it's been so much fun. Um, literally, uh, well, one goofy kind of example is that I stand outside of the building with foam core, you know, of the presentation, and, and to ask people, their, what do they think of this as an idea for what could happen here? <laughs> Literally. And, um, and we go around talking about it and asking people, you know, how do they spend their money, you know, in the neighborhood, and where would they like, would they consider spending it in a place like this? You know, and they, and I've been incredibly sort of flipped out, not all that surprised, but we haven't gotten any any opposition at all from anybody. They're just like, you mean you can turn a jail into something that's useful? And like, yeah, why not? They're like, yeah, why not? <laughs> it's just people, if you give them something to think, something else to think about, they will. That, but that's what you know, that's what communications is. It's just like making them look at one thing in a different way, even just from a different vantage point. It's really kind of cool. It's pretty, yeah, I enjoy that. I know that was a really goofy kind of thing, but it, but I swear it's hilarious to see like this this bizarre woman out there saying with the, with foam core boards. It's pretty fun. So there you go. Um, what are your ages for your job training programs, or do you not limit ages? Oh yeah, I mean we'd have to start at eighteen. Okay. You know, for, and, and the one that I did when I was in the Bronx, we started at 18 because everybody um, at all the employers that we worked with had to, everybody had to have uh, a driver's license. Well, do you, but do you have cutoffs for maximum no. age? Okay. No, no, no. Actually, um, I think the oldest person that went through our program um, was probably about 55. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. He'd been through a lot and would, had come out the other side and he was awesome. Hi. Hi. Oh, right, there right you go. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of linking back to that, the previous question about brownfields and contaminated sites and working in a, an urban place where there's been so much industry. How have you kind of combated that and, and worked with, I don't know, are you working with the EPA to clean up those sites and actually remediate them so they are healthy? Yeah. I mean, we do our job training program, people actually got that kind of training, you know, whether through um, OSHA. So they, as part of their training, they did... A now I can't remember, but it was either two or three different um, certifications and different types of brownfield remediation. So that was a good thing. Um, there's been huge uh, advances in, in terms of cleaning up contaminated sites. I mean, what we're the the thing for this particular site, um, what we've not gotten on site just yet, but we're pretty sure that it's just asbestos and lead, which you can clean up. Like, that's all. I mean, we're hoping. We're hoping it's not much more than that, because otherwise it would be problematic. But we're pretty sure that that's what it is. And if we can do that, we can, that can, we can clean up. And hopefully, many of them will have gone through my job training program from back in the day. And, uh, and then they'll have jobs, too, which would be awesome. Thanks for letting me be a repeat offender. <laughs> um, are you familiar with the Croc Centers? Hey, what? Uh -huh. The what? Um, Croc. Do you know the family Croc? They helped to develop McDonald's. Oh, the, the, um, how do you say that? Croc. Croc? Like it's a croc. Life is a croc. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, so I know it was the, pronounced that the, way. The croc centers, um, they've provided a certain amount of money and that it has to get um, competed for in different cities. I think there's one in L.A. Mm -hmm. that just opened to be a community center with socioeconomic different levels of a gym and community center. And it's done with and through the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. We now have a croc center here. Huh in the West Rox well, in Roxbury, on the Roxbury-Dorchester line. And I'm just wondering, when we're talking about these different levels, the Crocs had this thought process. They've been contributing these dollars and trying to get the Salvation Army, who love them, but they don't have the skill right now to manage a gym and things like that. But that's what they're trying to do, because Crocs said, I'll give you this money if you do this and have a community center. Mm -hmm. And they're going into neighborhoods that need that transformation. Mm -hmm. And um, I know this because my wife works for the Salvation Army. but. The Croc Center has the ideal that you're talking about to be a community center to support different economic means, have you know people join a gym, to have different economic means. And I'm wondering if you paired that around the globe mm -hmm. with your root stuff. Mm -hmm. There's the community center that could support the agricultural you know, offices and the, the people that are involved in it. You might have a link. 
So yeah. build it and they will come. Huh. Yeah, that's, that's the point. All right. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I like this repeat offender. <laughs> Hi. Good evening and thank you for coming to Boston. Um, for a municipality looking to support urban agriculture, what would you uh, pass along as top three priorities or key advice? Uh, definitely free land with a long-term lease. Um, really working with whoever wants to do it uh, to develop, like to see what kind of occurring subsidies are already in place, in particular of wage support, you know, for folks that really need that work. So whether it's, um, you know, on the job training, you know, different, because there, there's, there's always money for this type of stuff. It's like, how do you package it to make sure that you're make, making it as easy as possible, um, you know, for these jobs to get to the people that really need them? And to really also create the kind of of a of new type of food system within within a municipality that's going to happen. So you know, if by chance there were, there are things that, that a municipality can do in their purview in terms of of could there be a premium you know on uh, um, local so on, on local source food local source food you know in within the within different cities uh, departments. That would be in the particular school system, so that they that they if they buy you know from local systems, you know could could they pay a little bit more? You know, are there op operations that would support that kind of thing? I mean, really just making it so that you you put a priority on the development of of truly of developing a local food system in the city, so that it serves the city for on many many different angles. You know, from a job creation angle to the community health angle as well. Um, and that those and that building these facilities literally provides you know a, a, a type of economic stability in communities where there actually isn't a lot of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking for anyway. <laughs> hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, so you mentioned earlier that you employed some people who may have been incarcerated before. Oh which I think is really interesting. And also, obviously, being in the Bronx, probably most of the people, those 25 people that you have employed. Oh, no, no, no. The 25 folks were actually, that was the, um, the, the estimate that we were getting from our partner in the Urban Ag Project. Oh, OK. Yeah. We, um, we did employ some folks, but we mostly got them employed by other folks so in, in our job training program. So we got about 85% of the folks that went through our training program employed. And we, we employed a very few of them, you know, in terms of our, uh, um, we had a, a particular, like a, a, a Greenway Steward program, you know, where they, people literally went out. They were like the public um, outreach arm, and they also did uh, street tree maintenance. But specifically, they, they talked to people about the benefit, you know, of and this environmental remediation that was going on in the community in terms of Greenway development and things of that nature. Um, we didn't actually employ that many people specifically for, for those type of jobs. We just, we just set up the, the, the infrastructure to get them employed. Well, I guess my question for you then would be, um, if you are planning, oh, where'd you go? I looked down and I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I was like, whoops, there she goes. <laughs> um, I guess my question is, uh, if you are planning on um, hiring within, obviously you're hiring within the community, or if you're planning on tr um, trying to hire within a diverse age and like somebody mm -hmm. else had a question about and um, different backgrounds because you could hire all the people who are uh, college graduates or you know who are the most qualified but are you going to try to hire people who maybe need that yeah I mean that, that's the point I mean frankly most of most of these we're the, the folks that we're looking at, you know, in many of these jobs are actually folks that have been left behind by our educational system. So their chances are, you know, for as, as grateful and as thrilled as I am that actually some of the folks that went through our job training program actually decided to go back, to actually to go to school, they got their GED and then decided to go to college. That's a much smaller minority. It's a very small minority. It's only like 10%, you know, of the folks that did that. Um, the other 90% were folks that got their GED just because they knew that they were going to have to have one in order to, to move into whatever position they were going into. So these are not the folks, for the most part, that, um, you know, have a college degree. And, but they are the folks that, you know, in many, like if they were born 20 years, 30 years before, would have been working, you know, in, in, in a factory. 
doing something like that. But we don't we don't really have those. So some of the things that we're working on is actually about trying to figure out what are some real strategies that we need. So we're not making busy work for people, but how do you? Because there is there is some science, you know, to this horticultural infrastructure stuff. Like you need to know what you're doing. There is science, and if you're going to be, you know, a master gardener, you know, in in a greenhouse, there is science in understanding all this stuff. And if you don't, if you're not trained to do it, you're not going to know what you're doing. So there's it's it's not this field work, you know, that I hear a lot of people talking about. You know, there are entry level positions, but then there's a lot, always a lot more than that as well. So we're we're building this up, you know, as alternatives because not everybody's going to get the type of college education that, you know, would be nice if we all did. But I do think that it, on some level, um, you know, we're also, we're, we need this kind of stuff as we're moving into the stage where we also have to learn to adapt to our, to our changing climate. And these are some, these are some very strategic ways to do it. And we, we see with, the, with trends in, in increasing the way that they do, in particular around um, weather patterns, transportation costs, energy costs, that this kind of stuff is actually going to start to make a whole lot more sense. And we want people to be prepared for it. Thank you. In the, in the context of urban farming, you talked about hydroponics. Mm -hmm. uh, but have you thought about aquaculture, fish farming, and, and the like? We have, and um, in most of the folks uh, that we're working with who know a lot more about the actual technology than I do, um, actually want to keep it separated because, it's, frankly, it just seems like it's an easier way to gunk up the works. Either you do aquaponics or you do them both. But in, and because it's, 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 it's a lot more than I could tell you right now, and I don't know the full answer, but mo most of the folks that we're working with are just like, let's make sure that it works really well from the hydroponics standpoint, and then if we want to bring in aquaponics, we will. But... We're, they're keeping them separate for now. Makes sense to all of us. Um, and um, so let's just give a round of applause for this amazing, amazing woman who has um, done so much. You know, we've, we've been through quite a journey tonight, you know, um, from, you know, we've really shown how one person's trash can be transformed into a community's treasure, how ra we're raising the bar on economic development, using green real estate development as a platform for economically transforming our communities, turning people who are dependent on taxpayers into people who are paying taxes, um, and segregating out hope, you know, We've turned segregating out hope to rooting for hope, so I think oh, that's um, that that's 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 great. Um, what an inspiring evening and, and great talk. <laughs> Thanks so much. I like your notes. <laughs> I might use them. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>